Hello friends, welcome or welcome back to Path Chat and Chai. Thank you so much for stopping by. Today we're going to highlight key diagnostic features of anaplastic large cell lymphoma and discuss some common pitfalls so you can avoid them in your practice. Grab the beverage of your choice. I've got Chai and I'll meet you at the scope. Okay, friends, let's dive into the first case. So this is a 17-year-old girl who presented with uh, epigastric pain. She visited her local hospital and she was diagnosed as acute gastritis and was given a pylori medication. After a couple of months, she uh, presented again with recurrent episodes of vomiting with coffee ground substance. An endoscopy was done and showed a gastric mass. And uh, these are biopsies from the stomach uh, referred from the outside hospital. So you can see here, this is the mucosa. There is expansion of the lamina propria with uh, mixed uh, chronic inflammation. So there is mixed inflammatory cells. As you go down, you see granulation tissue, um, but then you start seeing an atypical infiltrate uh, consists of diffuse sheets of uh, large atypical cells with abundant cytoplasm. Some of uh, some areas shows clear cytoplasm. Some of the areas shows eosinophilic cytoplasm. The nuclei are large, uh, either round or um, uh, polymorphic, polylobated, or irregular uh, kidney shaped nuclei. Uh, here it has this kidney shape, very prominent or horseshoe shaped nuclei. And as you go uh, around, you start seeing some clearing in the cytoplasm. So now a gastric biopsy with cohesive sheets of atypical cells. Could it be a carcinoma perhaps? I always tell my resident, not just because I'm presenting the case, it has to be a lymphoma. We have to think of other differential diagnoses, but keeping in mind that this is only a 17 year old girl and carcinoma would be less likely where you can see here, there is an, uh, some atypical uh, cells have the signet ring appearance to them. And then uh, again, you have the other cells with a large uh, cells with irregular nuclei, abundant isonophilic cytoplasm. Some of them push to the side. Uh, you have again, the kidney shape nuclei. Uh, let's go to the other fragment. This fragment now shows more ulceration over here. There is fibrin, granulation tissue, and uh, a lot of debris, apoptotic bodies, uh, and uh, evidence of necrosis. But if we go high power, you see the uh, same infiltration of large atypical cells. Again, they appear to be uh, cohesive, but some of the areas show discohesiveness. Uh, again, they are polymorphic uh, with um, a large vesicular chromatin, prominent nucleoli. Uh, some of the nucleo nuclei uh, have this, again, kidney shape or horseshoe shape nuclei with uh, multiple prominent nucleoli. Um, uh, again, you have, uh, some of them have clear cytoplasm, some of them have real uh, isonophilic uh, cytoplasm. So with this uh, presentation, the age and the morphology, pause the video here and come up with your own panel of immunohistochemical stains that you would perform and we'll be back. Okay, so we're back now uh, with the still images. And let's look at the morphology now here. Again, as I showed you in the biopsies, you can see sheets of atypical cells. They are pleomorphic. Uh, some of them have a monomorphic round uh, vesicular chromatin prominent nucle nucleoli and uh, some clearing around them, giving you or making you think that, hmm, could this be carcinoma or something else? And other areas, as I showed you, you start seeing variable amounts of uh, the kidney shape, hallmark cells or a horseshoe shaped cells, or some of them are looking like a donut wreath like cell. Again, here you have these horseshoe shaped cells, uh, quite a few of them in this 
um, field with the background of apoptosis and a karyorexis. So with this uh, clinical features and morphological findings, we did a couple of immunohistochemical stains. Now, given that the cytokeratin was neg negative and you don't think that it is a carcinoma with it a CD45, so you can see mostly uh, negative. There is some variable dim staining. Uh, then this is CD20, which was negative. CD3 and CD43 also were negative. So now you have these large cells. Uh, the, some of them have uh, multi, are multilobated with a horseshoe shape um, nuclei, or even bilobated with prominent multiple nucleoli. Uh, with the CD45, CD3, CD20 negative, you thought could it be? Okay, Hodgkin lymphoma or something else. We did a CD30. CD30 is strongly positive and it shows you sheets of um, positive atypical cells and the characteristic membranous and Golgi staining. For To uh, rule out Hodgkin lymphoma also in our lab, we do fasten frequently. Fasten was positive, uh, PAX5 was negative, and CD15 negative. So when you have a PAX5 negative, I always question a Hodgkin lymphoma. And with the horseshoe-shaped nuclei, with the sheets of CD30 positive cells, a young uh, female with an extra nodal presentation, uh, we always put anaplastic Larsen lymphoma in the differential diagnosis. And we did an ALK stain, which was a nicely and strongly positive, showing you a cytoplasmic and nuclear staining. So anaplastic uh, Larsen lymphoma um, are characterized by variable presence of horseshoe shape nuclei, which are called the hallmark cells. Uh, they are characterized by strong CD30 positive, as the case uh, that I showed you, ALK positivity means uh, ALK rearrangement and different ALK staining pattern correlates with a different chromosomal translocation. The most common translocation involves chromosome 2 5, the NPM and ALK uh, genes and when uh, NPM is involved you have nuclear iron cytoplasmic staining just like our case. ALK positivity uh, carries a good prognosis with an overall survival of 80%. Let's look at another case. So the this is a 47-year-old male who presented with generalized lymphadenopathy, B symptoms, a needle core biopsy was performed and shows this sheets of, again, proliferation of atypical cells. Now, these cells show a more prominent horseshoe shape nuclei over here or kidney-shaped nuclei, abundant uh, cytoplasm, amphophilic to eosinophilic, and uh, some of them are there in this uh, case you see prominent uh, donut shaped cells. So they are wreath like all around uh, with a central halo. Yeah. Again, we uh, the immunohistochemical stains were similar to the previous case. CD30 again shows you sheets of atypical cells with the uh, membranous and uh, Golgi staining. Uh, so with the morphology and the CD30 positivity, uh, this was highly suggestive for anaplastic Larsen lymphoma. However, this case was ALK negative. So you can stop there and you call it ALK negative anaplastic Larsen lymphoma. As you know, in the WHO, this is a, a separate category. However, uh, you you need to differentiate it from other peripheral T cell lymphomas with CD30 positivity. Uh, these uh, lymphomas, the ALK negative and aplastic Larsen lymphomas, uh, morphologically resemble ALK positive uh, ALCLs. So they have large pleomorphic cells with lobated vesicular nuclei and prominent nucleoli, similar to the ALK positive cells. However, they the ALK negative ALCLs are subcategorized into uh, specific entities. Mostly 30% of them carry a rearrangement in the DASP22 uh, gene. So, and the DASP22 rearranged. Uh, 
uh, ALCLs uh, characterized by new plastic cells with a donut cell appearance. Uh, if you have uh, the means to do cytogenetics for uh, DAF22 rearrangements, uh, go ahead and do it. We didn't have access to that, uh, but it has been reported that the DAF22 uh, positive cells are strongly positive for LEF1 expression. So we went ahead and stained it for LEF1, and this was strongly uh, positive. So uh, the next, the, the second point here is that you have ALK positive ALCLs and ALK negative ALCLs. Uh, ALK negative ALCLs can um, carry a worse prognosis. However, it has been published that DAS22 positive uh, ALCLs carry a good prognosis just as the ALK positive ALCLs. So it might be worth staining for if you have cytogenetic studies or you have the fish in your lab, send it for DAS22 rearrangement, or you can do a LEF1 stain and perhaps suggest to the clinician because because this might affect the uh, therapeutic plan or the prognostication of the patient. Okay, let's move on to the next case. So this was a middle-aged male who presented with, again, generalized lymphadenopathy and uh, fever. Uh, so a lymph node biopsy was done uh, at a peripheral hospital and was sent for review. In this lymph node, you can see that the lymph node architecture is effaced. You don't have the cortex medulla lymphoid follicles, and there is just sheets of eosinophils. So at the beginning, it was thought that these might be eosinophilic microabscesses, and do we need to rule out uh, a kind of vasculitis, perhaps? Uh, other areas, if you look closer, you see reed stemberg like cells over here, binucleated with primary nuclei, and then other areas show smaller monomorphic kind of atypical cells with, again, in abundant sheets of eosinophils. Uh, more and more, you see polylobated nuclei, and some of them have, again, the kidney shape or horseshoe shape uh, nuclei. Uh, the CD45 here was positive, CD43 positive. So at the beginning, I think it was regarded as a mixed uh, reactive T cells in a background of xenophils. But if you look closer, the large cells, which look like uh, Hodgkin-like cells, are also CD43 positive. CD3 was negative. So now now you have this aberrant loss of a CD3 and CD4 was uh, positive. CD30 now is positive and you can see the large cells over here showing you again the membranous and the Golgi staining. Uh, many of them have this membranous and Golgi staining and there were sheets of CD30 positive cells. So here again we thought this is, is most likely an uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. You have to differentiate it from any other peripheral T cell lymphoma with CD30 positivity. If you have the hallmark cell Cells. You have the sheets of re uh, kidney shaped cells or what looks like an ALCL otherwise, uh, then you call it is ALK negative and a plastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, for confirmation, we sent it for T cell receptor, which was positive. And we always uh, recommend also to do uh, cytotoxic markers when you don't have a lot of T cell marker positivity. And this one showed very focal granzyme um, positivity and uh, the cytotoxic markers are uh, quite helpful. So the last case is a, a young lady who presented with a lymph node enlargement uh, and it was sent uh, to us for review. As you can see here by low power, you have a thick capsule over here and a nodular appearance and you have these uh, cellular nodules in the middle. So definitely by low power, it gives you a Hodgkin look to it. And over here you see uh, the thick collagen bands dividing the lymph node into nodules. A uh, closer look, show, you can see large uh, cells, the horseshoe shape again cells, or you might argue these are reed stemberg cells. So we had a scattered atypical reed stemberg like cells with prominent nuclei, and then again, binucleated, very nice, uh, atypical um, uh, uh, 
Hodgkin lymphoma cell or Reed Stenberg like cell. Uh, CD45, CD3, CD20 were negative in the large cell, so good for Hodgkin. CD30 showed sheets of cells. So this was referred as classical Hodgkin lymphoma, and you can see why uh, we would think of classical Hodgkin lymphoma, but then the Pax5 was negative, Fasin was positive. Again, if you do Fasin in your lab, um, the Fasin was positive, but uh, we also did a CD43 and CD4. So CD43 and CD4 here clearly highlights the large atypical uh, cells. And this is where you stop and you think, could it be uh, a T-cell lymphoma? Could it be uh, an aplastic large cell lymphoma? The ALK was negative here, but after this, the patient also presented with uh, BV, PV bleeding and uh, she also had endometrial masses, which were positive for the same lesion. So when we have extra nodal involvement, especially like, for example, the uterus, you really want to consider a T-cell lymphoma with this morphology, again, the horseshoe-shaped nuclei and the diffuse CD30 positivity. We thought this, this is most consistent with an ALK negative anaplastic large cell lymphomas. So um, in summary, we have seen some of the common pitfalls that we face. Um, the first one would be morphologically mimicking classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So here you have to correlate with the age and the distribution, the PET scan, is it conti continuous or not, a nodal versus extra nodal. Whenever I have a child with an extra nodal involvement presenting with a lung or a soft tissue mass or a GI mass, I always consider anaplastic large cell lymphoma. Uh, and then always remember that anaplastic large cell lymphoma can present with a Hodgkin lymphoma like variant. The other pitfall is when you have a neutrophilic rich or eosinophilic rich variant. So just keep in mind that anaplastic large cell lymphoma has many variants. You can have a small cell variant, like one of the examples that we saw. You can have neutrophilic rich variant, and there are um, case reports with eosinophilic rich variants. We tend to think of classical Hodgkin lymphoma when we see nodules or when we see eosinophils, uh, but as we know T-cell lymphomas and anaplastic large cell lymphomas can have a xenophilic background. Uh, the other pitfall is that they can mimic uh, poorly differentiated carcinomas, especially that because ALCL are known to be cohesive and they can be positive for EMA, very, very rarely cytokeratin. So always keep in mind, put the age in, uh, in mind, put everything in context um, and throw in your lymphoid markers. If your cytokeratin markers and epithelial markers are uh, negative. Uh, if you have a Pax5 negative tumor, uh, request more pan T cell markers, uh, request cytotoxic markers, and uh, you can always do a T cell receptor gene rearrangement to uh, make sure that this is a T cell lymphoma. Uh, as we saw uh, here, the the first case had was very cohesive. It had a signet ring appearance, and EMA can be positive. And if you just stop at a CD45 uh, and CD3 and CD20, you might miss uh, anaplastic large cell lymphoma. The other pitfall is uh, fasten positivity. If you do fasten in your lab and uh, classical Hodgkin lymphomas are commonly positive for fasten, but ALCLs are also positive for fasten. So if you have a lymphoma with CD30 positivity, sheets, even uh, fasten positivity does not make it Hodgkin. Make sure you do other pan T cell markers and do cytotoxic markers to make sure that you're not missing a T cell lymphoma. Also, the other pitfall that we have seen uh, is because uh, ALCLs can be MUM1 positive and CD56 positive. So if you have a fully differentiated neoplasm with sheets of uh, atypical cells and MUM1 is positive and CD56 positive, you might uh, go uh, into the rabbit hole of a plasma cytoid neoplasm or plasmacytic neoplasm. Uh, again, CD30 can be positive in a plasmablastic lymphoma. So 
pan T cell markers, cytotoxic markers, uh, think of ALCL. Uh, ALCLs can also be positive for CD30. So you can think of myeloid neoplasm. But if you have a systemic approach, you always do your pan B and T cell markers. You do extra T cell markers. Uh, it was remember, interpret IHCs in the context of full panel, never in isolation. Now it's your time to chat. Let us know in the comments below what strategies you use to avoid these pitfalls. And as always, stay curious, keep learning, and enjoy your shy. Until next time.